Welcome to No Compromise, where faith and reason fuse in conversation. Jenny and I continue with our conversation about C.S. Lewis's The Silver Chair. The, the foundation, the structure of being is God, and God is transcendent. He's beyond this world, and therefore everything that is in being around us is right. merely indicating a higher, more real being. Right. And those are the two visions. We can accept the one or we can accept the other. Right. But both sides are faith. Both sides of the looking glass, looking glass require us to believe a metaphysical vision of reality. Yes, I see now, said Jill, in a heavy, hopeless tone. That is, she becomes convinced by the merely rational, mm -hmm. by the hyper-rational. It must be so. And while she said this, it seemed to her to be very good sense. Slowly and gravely, the witch repeated, There is no sun. And they all said nothing. She repeated in a softer and deeper voice, There is no sun. After a pause, and after a struggle in their minds, all four of them said together, You're right. There is no sun. It was such a relief to give in and say it. There never was a sun, said the witch. No, there never was a sun, said the prince and the marsh wiggle and the children. For the last few minutes Jill had been feeling that there was something she must remember at all costs. And now she did. But it was dreadfully hard to say it. She felt as if huge weights were laid on her lips. At last, with an effort that seemed to take all the good out of her, she said, There's Aslan. And this, we said, is a critical moment. Mm -hmm. And it is analogous to the turnaround of the moment in Eden when Eve convinces Adam to take the fruit. Right. This is the opposite right. of that. Because this is the woman in the proper role, mm -hmm. not convincing the man to do the wrong thing but anchoring him to the reality of relationship. Exactly. To the evident. And this moment is particularly poignant for me mm -hmm. and best explains those French words with which we begin each episode mm -hmm. of No Compromise. Qu'ils sont beaux les pieds. How beautiful are the feet. This was your role, my Jenny, in my return to Christ. I had lived the abstraction, mm -hmm. the hyper-rational, um, the rarefied air of speculative thought, of philosophy. But you anchored me again to the real, right. to the solid, to relationship with being mm -hmm. that is the essence of the evident. Mm -hmm. I reconnected with reality, with the incarnate Son of God through you yeah. as the reality in my life. Mm -hmm. So this moment for me really encapsulates no compromise right. and the Christian atheist. Right. Because men get caught up in abstractions. With intellect, and that's when they, they go astray. And women are anchored. And we actually saw this in, in an episode of, the, mm -hmm. of Jordan Peterson exactly. we were listening to this week, mm -hmm. talking about that. Right. That women, because of the very nature of who they are, are anchored to reality right. in ways that men are not. Exactly. Um, and this is Jill's role. Right. She calls them back through the fundamental importance of relationship, the right. value of relationship. Right. And it is Aslan that anchors everything. Right. And at this point, we see that the witch gets nervous. Yes, yeah, she for gets the first nervous time. for the first time. It's the she's one, starting to feel like she's losing control. The one power that she knows that she is not above. Right. Aslan, said the witch, quickening ever so slightly the pace of her thrumming. What a pretty name. And again, back to the questioning. Right. What does it mean? <laughs> right? So she never allows them to stand. She right. forces them to think about, to rationalize right. what it is they're talking about, right. rather than to stand on the evident. He is the great lion who called us out of our own world, said Scrub, and sent us into this to find Prince Rillian. 
And then she does it again. What is a lion? So here she takes their, their attention off of the lion to a lion. Right. And away from the relationship mm -hmm. to another abstract intellectual question. Right. What is a lion? Oh, hang it all, said Scrub. Don't you know? How can we describe it to her? Have you ever seen a cat? So the Christian goes back to the same mm -hmm. analogy <laughs> thing analogy. that we tried before. Right. And has as much success with the witch as before. Exactly. Because the witch actually doesn't care. Right. Just like the atheists don't care. Right. They're not searching for the truth. Mm -mm. What they want is to destroy, destroy the you. argument. Exactly. Right. Just destroy you, take you down, and control you. Right. Surely, said the queen. I love cats. <laughs> and you told me I'm not allowed to say that she's an old cat lady. <laughs> but all old cat ladies are evil. <laughs> oh, I'm getting pinched. I'm getting pinched. Well, a lion is a little bit, only a little bit, mind you, like a huge cat with a mane. At least it's not like a horse's mane, you know. It's more like a judge's wig, and it's yellow. And terrifically strong. <laughs> and we see Eustace here just utterly failing right. to make a coherent argument in the face of the queen's questioning. Right. The witch shook her head. I see, she said, that we should do no better with your lion, as you call it, than we did with your son. You have seen lamps. And you have imagined a bigger and better lamp and called it the sun. You've seen cats, and now you want a bigger and better cat, and it's to be called a lion. Well, tis a pretty make-believe, though, to say truth, it would suit you all better if you were younger. And look how you can put nothing into your make-believe without copying it from the real world, this world of mine. And this is the argument of the empiricist, mm -hmm. of scientism who want to reduce everything to what is merely the empirical real, that which can be quantified, mm -hmm. and not to that which is pointed to. Right. And so she makes fun of them. There is no Narnia. Put away these childish tricks. No overworld. No sky. No sun. No Aslan. And this is her last gambit. Mm -hmm. And now to bed all. And let us begin a wiser life tomorrow. But first, to bed, to sleep, deep sleep, soft pillows, sleep without foolish dreams. So she presents herself as the voice of reason, mm -hmm. the voice of rationality. The prince and the two children were standing with their heads hung down, their cheeks flushed, their eyes half closed, the strength all gone from them. The enchantment almost complete. But Puddleglum, desperately gathering all his strength, walked over to the fire. Then he did a very brave thing. He knew it wouldn't hurt him quite as much as it would hurt a human, for his feet, which were bare, were webbed and hard and cold-blooded like a duck's, but he knew it would hurt him badly enough. And so it did. With his bare foot, he stamped on the fire, grinding a large part of it into ashes on the flat hearth. And three things happened at once. First, the heavy, sweet smell grew very much less. For though the whole fire had not been put out, a good bit of it had, and what remained smelled very largely of burnt marsh wiggle, <laughs> which is not at all an enchanting smell. <laughs> This instantly made everyone's brain far clearer. Why? Because one of the things about the nature of the evidence mm -hmm. that you cannot avoid are the things that are unpleasant. Wait, exactly. <laughs> that brings you back to reality. Exactly. Just like Jill's question about relation, the relationship with Aslan brought them back to reality. Right. This is another way mm -hmm. because it forces them to face reality at its most basic. Right. In Puddleglum's case, the pain. Mm -hmm. But in the rest of their cases, it's the flying away of the happiness. And suddenly they're faced with a reality that they can't avoid. Exactly. 
and their brains become clearer. They begin mm -hmm. to think more clearly again. Mm -hmm. The prince and the children held up their heads again and opened their eyes. Secondly, the witch, in a loud, <laughs> terrible voice, utterly different from all the sweet tones she had been using up till now. So when all of the enchantment goes, mm -hmm. you can see the queen for who she is. Right. The shrill, mean, controlling female. Right. What are you doing? Dare to touch my fire again, mud filth, and I'll turn the blood to fire inside your veins. So the anger comes out again. Mm -hmm. She calls Puddle Glum mud filth, which reminds me in the Harry Potter of mudbloods, the wizards who had mixed their blood with the non-wizarding people. But the idea here is that he's a scum. Right. He's the scum of the earth. Mm -hmm. He's the lowest of the, the low. The lowest of the low, like the mm -hmm. mice. Mm-hmm. In, in the Lion, Witch, in the Lion the Witch, and the Wardrobe. And also, in the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, the White Witch completely ignores these little mice, and right. they're the ones that unbind Aslan. Right. In this, the witch is completely ignoring Puddleglum. Right. She wrote him off, basically. He's able to sneak away and burn himself. Yep. So yeah, and that's actually a theme that we see again, yeah. uh, again in Harry Potter. Sorry to bring mm -hmm. us back to Harry Potter. But that... What is it that ultimately brings down many of the, the, the schemes that the Dark Lord Voldemort mm -hmm. plans in Harry Potter? It's the, uh, the house elves mm -hmm. that he dismissed as utterly useless right. and ridiculous. So it's the common. Yep, the common. So the common comes back with a vengeance because the wise, those right. who, who consider themselves wise, won't stoop to consider them. And in the Bible, God says he's made foolish the wisdom of the wise. That's right. And Third, used, I'm sorry, and used the simple to confound the wise. That's right. Thirdly, the pain itself made Puddle Glum's head for a moment perfectly clear. And pain does that yes, more than anything else. That's for sure. We can rationalize all we want about things and try to create our own reality. But pain brings us back exactly. to reality, mm -hmm. the real thing. There's nothing more real than pain. And he knew exactly what he really thought. And here's the moment. This, if I were to cry in this one, this would be the moment, but I don't think <laughs> I'm going to. There is nothing like a good shock of pain for dissolving certain kinds of magic. Mm -hmm. One word, ma'am, he said, coming back from the fire, limping, because of the pain. One word, all you've been saying is quite right. I shouldn't wonder. And here we have the gloominess of the marsh wiggles right. coming out. I'm a chap who always liked to know the worst and then put the best face I can on it. So I won't deny any of what you said. But there's one more thing to be said even so. Suppose we have only dreamed or made up all those things. Trees and grass and sun and moon and stars and Aslan himself. Suppose we have. Then all I can say is that, in that case, the made-up things seem a good deal more important than the real ones. Suppose this black pit of a kingdom of yours is the only world. Well, it strikes me as a pretty poor one. And that's a funny thing when you come to think of it. We're just babies making up a game, if you're right. But four babies playing a game can make a play world, which licks your real world hollow. That's why I'm going to stand by the play world. I'm on Aslan's side, even if there isn't any Aslan to lead it. I'm going to live as like a Narnian as I can, even if there isn't any Narnia. So thanking you kindly for our supper. <laughs> if these two gentlemen and the young lady are ready. We're leaving your court at once and setting out in the dark to spend our lives looking for overland. Not that our lives will be very long, I should think. That's small loss if the world's as dull a place as you say. And in this is encapsulated, for me, the moment of turning back to God. Because, as I say in the evident evidence and faith, the choice is not one of rationality. Because both sides have a rational story. It's one of value. Right. And if you want to trust your reasoning process, if you want to believe in beauty and goodness and value and the lives and love of the people around you, then you need to choose God's world. Mm -hmm. 
because that's the only one that vouches <laughs> and you're doing the evangelical nod. <laughs> that's the only vision of the world that vouchsafes our rational structures. I value science, mm-hmm. and therefore I choose God. Right. Not the other way around. Right. And that's your ending to the Christian atheist. Yes. This you know, is why can... I am a Christian. Right, right. And it's a choice of value. Right. And if we read this, I mean, if, it, if an atheist would read this, they would say, aha, see, I told you. Mm-hmm. It's just a subjective thing. They just, no, they're doing the same thing. They too are choosing a value. Exactly. In going the other direction. Mm-hmm. They're not basing it on rationality. Mm -hmm. The rational stories that we tell on both sides are compelling. Mm -hmm, Exactly. They're good stories, Mm -hmm. but we have to choose. And faith requires us to choose on the basis of something. Right. And rationality is based on value, not the other way around. And value is evident. Exactly. So I think that's where you could stop reading because they leave. And we're not going to say what happens right. to the witch. <laughs> right. You have to read to find out the rest. Read the story yourself to find right. out what happens. Now, when we were reading that, I was thinking, do you remember when the witch first comes in, Prince Rillian confidently states, she, she says, what's going on here? You know, he confidently states, I am Prince Rillian, son of the King Caspian, and we're leaving. Yes. And then suddenly they get under this enchantment. Then... They come out of the enchantment, and again, Puddleglum confidently states, I don't care what you say, I'm we're going. Right. I'm, okay. But they could have avoided that whole middle part if really yes. would have just stood in his confidence <laughs> instead of going back and forth. And Christians, I think, get trapped that way. We do. Yeah. Yeah, the if wavering we just, of faith. Yeah, if we would just be confident. And I, and I think of Jesus when he was confronted. He never chased after people. He never continued an argument back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. Right. He said he was confident. He said the truth and that was it, you know, and then I assume he walked away or he left people astounded. That's for sure. Right. But I, I can't see him arguing back and forth with people. Yeah. Debating. So you're saying it's useless to argue with Asius? <laughs> <laughs> so my whole life is a waste of time. <laughs> no, not, you don't argue with atheists. But do you know what I'm saying? No, I do know what you're you saying. Get pulled into this enchantment. Yes. If you if you're not careful. Yes, and we in taking a stand, yeah. Yeah. we need to really stand mm-hmm. and move forward with it. Mm-hmm. We waffle way too much as Christians. Mm-hmm. This woke movement that has infiltrated the church mm-hmm. and the culture must be stood up to mm-hmm. and it must be rolled back right or we're done right and, and that's a matter way, of faith in some take way, a stand the arguments though what's that the arguments though that we have we have to be careful because we can get drawn in yep to this you know to what the witch did yep right yeah the rational arguments can carry us astray mm-hmm. and derail us in our faith right once we make a decision we need to stick by it right but that doesn't mean we can't revisit truths because faith is always based in uncertainty. But when we move forward, we become more and more certain and backing off of certainties that we've already established is, I think, what you're talking about, right? It, it's not that no uncertainties remain. It's that the things that we have discovered to be mm-hmm. true are worth holding on to. Right. And, and worth stand, fighting for. And not even fighting, just stand confidently. And move forward <laughs> and, just and go say, with it. Yeah, I don't have time for this. Yeah. I mean, this is so real and so true. God is so <laughs> real and true. It's why, like, it's why like, are we debating over the definition <laughs> of a man and a woman? Yeah. It's evident. Right. And you're so wrong. We don't, Let's move forward. Right, exactly. That's what I mean. Take control of the situation. Take control of the argument. Yes. And say, this is the truth. Yeah. We're not going to allow you to mutilate our children in pursuit of your twisted, your twisted ideology. I- yeah, your twisted ideas of gender. Yes. Yeah, we're <laughs> not no going gender. to allow you to change reality. Right. Then we're not going to let you tear down our faith by questioning us on how do you know there's a God? How, you know, or no, we're not going to do that. We're going to just say God is real and just move on. Yep. Okay. Some of the closing remarks. Um, 
one point is the faith of Puddleglum in Aslan versus the faith of the children. Right. We said that the children are from another world, almost like the intellectuals are from academia. Another world. Yeah, it's yes. like another world and yep. they're educated. Yep. And yeah. really in as well. Right. It re really intends to get, he gets drawn in along with the children. Right. These are the higher intellects, right? right? And intellect is his own trap. Right. And they're, and they're the ones that doubted. They weren't sure. They tried to rationalize. Yep. Whereas Puddleglum, he was simple, common, uneducated. Right. He was And anchored, grounded in the evidence yeah, in his life. The evidence. Real life. Yeah. And like we said before, he was like the mice. Right. In, um, Line which yeah, his faith is simple, right? And a simple faith. I, I mean, this—I I know coming from me, this sounds odd mm -hmm. because yeah, my my faith is is simple. the farthest thing from simple. <laughs> and I and I'm not—I make no apologies for having mm -hmm. gone through the route that I took. Right. But as we saw in the horse and his boy, each faith journey is different. Right. Exactly. And each person has a different role to play. Exactly. And the extreme rationality that I've gone through to find my way back to God, there are times when I say to myself, it would have been nice to just simply believe mm -hmm. and not have to fight through all of this. But that's not John But that's Wise. not who I am. Right. Exactly. But it is who Puddleglum is. Right. And it is also who the vast majority of believers in the world are. Mm -hmm. And I respect that faith right. immensely. But God wanted John Wise and his faith, just like he wants each one of us. Yes. Where we are. And he needed Jenny to be exactly where she was so that John could find her, fall in love, and then <laughs> find his own way back to Christ. Exactly. Okay. All right. So let's summarize real quick where we are in the Chronicles of Narnia. We started with the magician's nephew. And that taught us about evil and the nature of how things go bad. Then we moved on to the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, where we talked about the death and the resurrection of God in a society. Um, then we went on to the Horse and His Boy, and that one was harder because it's kind of like a personal narrative, means different things to different people in relation to each person's journey. And we skipped the other two, but we're here at the the Silver Chair, and this one was. What would you say? Faith, choices? Faith, choice, and grace. I and think consequences, too. Uh, oh, yeah, uh, that's right. And consequences. Yeah. Because and we see that there are consequences mm -hmm. for not following in faith the right. signs that God gives and us. And even the consequences, whatever caused Drillian to go astray. Yep. And follow there's also, the but there's also grace the at the end because yeah. God is in control of the. Of the structure right. of our story. Right. He's running it. And as Romans 8, 28 says, mm -hmm. he does work all things together for good. Exactly. But that doesn't mean we won't pay the consequences for the stupid things that right. we do. And sometimes we do not pay the consequences at all. <laughs> but the, the grace is and there as well. that's where the grace comes in. Yes. Right. So I don't know what we're going to talk about next time. No, nope, I guess we'll, we'll see. We'll start moving on. But the Christian Atheist is playing A series interviews. Of interviews, yes. That you have done over the past year. So if you want to tune into that, that the first one was this past mon Monday, and then we'll have many more to come. Right. Okay, my love. That's another one in the can. Okay, good. I adore you. I adore you, Johnny. I will see you next week. Actually, I'll see you in a few <laughs> seconds after we shut off this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Bye-bye. Bye. I am a Christian with the searching and skeptical mind of an atheist. I don't want to believe anything that isn't true. I know both sides of the looking glass, and I know them with open eyes. I choose Christ's side. I invite you to join me from wherever you stand before the looking glass. That's this week's episode. Thanks for listening, and remember, you can have your religious cake and eat it too. You can have reason, respect for science, a 21st century worldview, and be a Christian.